read from that, as I said earlier, that most profound place. And what I want to just say about this, having said what we just said then, you can see from John 1, 1 to 18, that prologue to John's Gospel, As I was saying, you can see from that prologue to John's Gospel that we looked at just in the beginning of the first talk, you can see from that how much the church grasped and was grasped by the truth, uh, and rather significant truth. The early church got that Jesus Christ was distinct from the Father, that is, he was his own person, as was the Holy Spirit but was also at the same time one with the Father and was fully God, as fully God as is the Father and so was the Spirit. The church got that. They particularly expressed this truth. They had occasion, they had a number of questions that got raised by heretics and they were able to express this truth in very clear ways in these councils that we talked about like Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople in 381 and Ephesus in 431. Chalcedon in 451, and in all of this work they did, all of this work they did, they understood and grasped and confessed a great deal of Scripture. But as we saw in their grasping of Scripture, in grasping doctrine of God and doctrine of man and doctrine of Christ, the person and the work, even as Anselm got that, there tended to be this, this overleaping or underdeveloping of the doctrine of the Spirit. And it's the Reformation that awaits that. So today we're going to talk about, or in this talk, we're going to talk about, first of all, the doctrine of justification, which is key within that, the work of the Holy Spirit. And then the fuller doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And then a Reformed ecclesiology, a Reformed view and approach to the church, as we think about some of the doctrines that drove the Reformation. But as we do that... Let's just begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll read some scripture. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this time that we have had together thus far in looking at your gracious leading and guiding of your people in the church throughout her history. Father, we see where the church grasped so much, and we see also uh, her error, uh, where she went astray, uh, and then even fell into some serious error in the later Middle Ages. Lord in heaven, we thank you for the Reformation that recovered the gospel and that extended that understanding of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this, Heavenly Father, and we pray that you would bless us now as we continue to look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, key in this, then, as we come to consider the Reformation of the church, and you might say, well, when did that start? Um, what would a typical starting point be seen as this? There's much that leads up to the Reformation. The Reformation is in development, you might say, for several centuries. It doesn't spring um, fully developed like Athena from the head of Zeus. Uh, it, it's, it's some many years in coming, uh, if you understand it. Uh, but what would... If, if, you, if somebody were to say to you, well, when did this Reformation thing begin? What, might you, what answer would you give? Yes. Okay, I thought you were raising your hand. Yes, Ron. Right. Everybody hear that? The posting of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther on the, uh, the chapel door of the castle church there in Wittenberg. Um, that was on October 31st, 1517. Uh, but again, these, you know, historians, we, there are things we hang our hats on, there are things we look at. It's rather hard to say precisely when this began. There was a general council from 1512 to 1517, the Fifth Lateran Council, that, that really didn't do anything substantive for the doctrinal problems that were facing the church that we talked about. But there was this recognition of these moral problems, and they were, these were being addressed all the time, the moral problems. Erasmus, I mentioned him. Erasmus was not a reformer. He lived at the time of the Reformation. And he was somebody who saw the moral problems with the church. Very clearly. But he was not an Augustinian. He did not agree with Augustine. 
He did not have Augustine. He was a semi-Pelagian. He did not have Augustine's view of sin and grace. He was a humanist. He did not agree with what was going on in the Reform. Uh, so saying he was a humanist didn't mean he didn't agree with the Reform. I don't mean to, I don't mean to cloud that. Yes? Could you define humanist as you're using he was, as a humanist, he was, we often speak of the um, uh, Renaissance or Renaissance, however you want to pronounce that, uh, and Reformation. Uh, Renaissance means rebirth, uh, and that often refers to the rediscovery of the classical sources, in the Middle Ages in particular, the classical world of Greek and Rome and its particular heritage had somewhat faded into the background as, as Christendom loomed large. Uh, and there was particularly in the attempts of, say, someone like Thomas Aquinas, this grand attempt to integrate all faith and knowledge and, and, and everything into sort of one great thing, which became in its own way the seeds of its own unraveling. And you say, well, explain that. Sorry, I can't. Just too much for right now. A lot of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of talking about the whole sweep of church history right now. So sometimes my head is going, mm -hmm, you can say this, you can say this, you can go down this path. But um, so what happens uh, in the late 1400s, uh, mid to late 1400s, uh, a number of things are happening. Uh, one of them is uh, um, Johannes Gutenberg and the development of Printing, right? Printing uh, came into uh, being and uh, a press at which this could be done with some uh, facility, some relative uh, facility. Um, so printing comes in, um, exploration is underway, Spain, uh, the other European countries, uh, you know, they, they keep trying to sail around uh, Africa and they finally decide to sail uh, west. To get to India, didn't quite work, but uh, they ran into some other things, uh, mainly the lands in which we live. So you had all this going on, and this is all sort of part of this uh, renaissance, this rebirth. And particularly in this rebirth, this, this focus on the, the Greek and the Latin and looking at these things from old Rome and Greece this, is, this makes up part of what's called humanism. It's an interest and a focus on man qua man, not just as in the Middle Ages, this focus on Christianity and God. This is now going to focus on man. And their, their cry becomes ad fontes, to the sources. And what they mean by to the sources is to the Greek and, and Roman sources. The Reformation is a kind of a religious version of that that says to the sources, meaning back to the scriptures. Because the scriptures were not being read at this point in, in a serious way. When you look at Lombard and then at Aquinas, this is part of the whole leading up to the Reformation. Um, on the one hand, even in the monasteries, which were the places of greatest scholarship that developed into schools, particularly you think of the Alcuin of York at the time of Charlemagne, that was a ninth century kind of renaissance. And out of that develops the university, okay? And it's a university. It's seeking to unify all knowledge. I mean, we still call them universities, which is quite amazing. They're not. They're multiversities. They're not universities. A university presupposes God and his truth is ultimately one. And it has all these different divisions. It has all these different departments. But I mean, we're, we're, we still live on all kinds of interesting capital from the past, so to speak. But humanism is this, is this uh, conviction of returning to the Greek and Roman sources. Um, what you have in the Reformation, then, is this, let's look at scripture again. Um, Lombard is quoting all the fathers and the medievalists up to his day. The way, that's the way you did theology. Theology, think of it this way, had in a measure 
come to be done like theologizing was done at the time of Jesus and Paul. How was theologizing done at the time of Jesus and Paul? What was, how did it go forward? What did you quote when you were theologizing at the time of Jesus and Paul? Not so much. That'd be good if you did that. That's the word of God. Do you say Old Testament? Yeah. No, see, you're too good of a theologian. The rabbis! They were quoting the, they were quoting the Bible. They were quoting the rabbis. And you had, to, you had to speak and you would say, Rabbi said, Rabbi said, Rabbi said, Rabbi said. Now it becomes that way even more in the 2nd century BC, <coughs> 3rd century, it becomes even more that way as rabbinical Judaism develops. It was just in its initial stages in the time of Jesus and Paul. But this is why J. Gresham Machen says, Either Jesus and Paul were wrong about the Jews of their day. I submit to you they weren't. Mm -hmm. They didn't think they were either. Jesus and Paul were wrong about the Jews of their day, or the Jews of their day were wrong about the Old Testament. The Jews of their day were wrong about the Old Testament. They read it as a book that taught salvation by works in some fashion. Now, that's very... You know, some, a scholar could argue with me about that, and I'd be happy to argue with him about that and put it in different kinds of terms. But that's not unfair. I, we don't have hours and hours and hours, and you're, I'm not assigning you tons of things to read. That's, a, that's not an unfair way of saying that's what happened. When Jesus and Paul came on the scene, the Jews of their day read the Old Testament as if they were saved by works. And nobody, ever since the fall, I mean, can be saved by works. We were put in a garden. We were told to obey, but we disobey. And that plunged the race into sin. And we need, divine re we need a divine rescue mission. And that's what we have in Jesus. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. So ever since the fall, we can't save ourselves. Before the fall, we didn't need to be saved. But ever since the fall, we can't save ourselves. And the Jews of the Old Testament, they were given the law to even show and intensify their need, as well as the way to walk. But they were given at the same time that sacrificial system. Why were they given a sacrificial system? Thank God for that. Because they were shown that though they're sinners and deserve to die, which the law will show you, God was pleased to accept the sacrifice of another. That's what the whole sacrificial system showed. God was pleased to accept the sacrifice of another in place of the one who was the offended one. You know, the sense being sort of symbolically transferred, pronounced over the head. When that lamb is killed, what does it mean? You don't want to die. I don't want to die. That's what it means. I deserve to die. That's what it means. It doesn't mean something else. It means that. But God is pleased to accept this. So that when John the Baptist cried, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He connected the whole thing up. He connected the whole thing up right there in one phrase. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's the one God is pleased to send to bear away all of our sins. And any Jew who knew anything knew what that meant. They understood what that meant. But of course they didn't understand what it meant because they were thinking they could save themselves. They were thinking they weren't so bad. Why am I taking a little time to say this? Because the Roman church, the church in the West, and a brother just asked me here, and I, I guess I've been confusing. When I say the Roman church, I mean the Roman Catholic church. I don't mean something about the Roman Empire. I hope that hasn't confused anybody. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church, of which we were, we were all a part. There was the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Western Church was a Roman Church. It went astray. But what happens in the 13th century, Lateran 4, 12, 15, the 14th, the 15th, what happens over several centuries is the Roman Church loses its way, particularly with respect to salvation. The Roman Church... And this is, a, this is just a key and easy way to understand this, and it's true. <coughs> the Roman church becomes, in a measure, 
comes to understand the Christian faith in the gospel like the Jews of old understood the book of their day. The Jews of old, and you said, well, you know, they sort of had a religion that could make you think that. Well, not if you really understood it. No one's ever been saved by works. Can't do it. But, yeah, it wasn't as clear. Now that Jesus has come, and the Apostle Paul, of all people, has said what he said, how can you possibly think that this is salvation by works? How can you, be, how can you in your wildest imagination, think that? That's what happened. You said, but that was supposed to be the last topic. You can't just divide these things. We divide history for our purposes. But it's all one. So now I'm really bringing this again. I'm giving you another perspective. To tell you what happened. What happened in the Roman church. Was like what happened at the time of Jesus and Paul. The Jews of, his, of their day thought salvation was by works. And many people in the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century had a practical view. Even though there was the Christian gospel there. Of the same thing. And just to plug it in. If you have a, it just to help you here. If you know something called the new perspective on Paul. And that ties in in a measure with federal vision. But that's also something different. But the new perspective on Paul is something that has arisen in the post-World War II era in New Testament scholarship. And the new perspective on Paul says, this view that I just gave you, that what was happening in the 14th, 15th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries in the Roman church, this corrupting of the gospel and this losing of the way, which was like what happened with the Jews of old, so that a new Phariseeism had arisen in the Roman church. The new perspective on Paul says that's all wrong. That's a complete wrong reading of that. Let's go back to the first reading. The Jews of Jesus in Paul's day didn't think salvation was by works in any sense. Really? I would beg to differ with them on a number of grounds with respect to that. And then they say, because that was wrongly gotten, the notion that, you know, the Bishop of Rome in 1400 was Pharisaical. There was nothing wrong with the Pharisees. So even if he is Pharisaical, there's nothing wrong with him. This is why it's called a new perspective on Paul. It's really a new perspective on everything. But it, boy, where does this come from? Why does it arise? It's not that I can't think of an answer to that. I'm thinking of about a million directions to go in. But just sociologically, part of it is it's perceived that saying the Jews of old had a religion of works and the, the Roman church in the 14th century, 15th century had something similar, that all of that is anti-Semitism. That's where this comes from. Now you need to, if you've never heard it, you're just going to have to absorb it. Where would that come from? I, please don't misunderstand me. I, please don't leave here not getting strange right here. The church has exhibited a lot of... Uh, uh, <laughs> wow, where do we start with this? <laughs> The Jews have received a lot of mistreatment at the hands of Christians throughout the ages. So have Christians at the hands of Jews. It started there. You understand that. If you don't, then we'll have to talk about that. But that's just, it starts on the pages of the New Testament. It starts with Jews against Christians, not the other way. And when the Roman Empire can't distinguish the two, you know how rulers typically, they, they well, this is some kind of a dispute among yourselves, Right? They can't distinguish. They think it's just another sect of Jews. You understand that from reading the New Testament. The Roman rulers, the Roman rulers, not Roman church, Roman political rulers, think that the Jews and the Christians initially are just all part of some 
I mean, there are several sects of Jews. There's Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots. Here's another one. Who makes it very clear that they're not part of the Jews? The Jews. Why? Because the Jews are not persecuted. They're allowed by the Romans. And the Jews say, don't allow these people. They're not us. Outlaw them. So, I mean, it starts there. It's, and it's a nasty history. And you know where it goes in the 20th century. I mean, there have been pogroms. You all know what pogroms are. There have been pogroms all along. And, of course, what happens with Hitler is just, wow. That's, you know, this attempt to wipe out European Jewry. But the response to that has been to hunt down anything that could possibly ever have contributed to that. Anything that could be conceived in any arguable way is anti-Semitic. That's the real origin sociologically of the new perspective on Paul. I mean, that's, you can look into it. She said, well, you mean it's not, pri it's not theological in its primary origin? No, it's not. It becomes that. But it's sociological. It's historical. It's perceived as it's anti-Semitic to have said that the Jews believe in a salvation by works. That led Christians to persecute them. And that's led the church to persecute Jews. And so we've got to reread all this. That's where the new perspective comes from. Yes? Right, correct. <clears throat> correct. Yeah, it's a, it's, and that, that doesn't come from the same place. That's different. Yeah. Because these people are, who are doing that are not liberals. But it's interesting how there are certain things, if, if, if something can be said to be anti Semitic, <coughs> you don't even have to have a discussion. We have that with other things. I mean, if you say something is racist, <clears throat> Well, let's look at what's being said here. Let's just analyze it. I mean, racism is a terrible thing. Anti-Semitism is a bad thing. But we're so, it's so interesting now. We allow all kinds, we celebrate sins. We celebrate them. We don't just allow them. Celebrate all sorts of sins. But there are other things that, it, you, if you just say the word anti-Semitism, that just has to end the discussion. Or if you say racism, that's just the end of this. There's no discussion. No discussion. So it's just an interesting kind of a thing. It's just, an, it's just interesting. And uh, yes, because real anti-Semitism is bad. Obviously, racism is a horrible thing. It, it, how it's been used, especially. Um, but yeah, so that's part of the origins of that. But so let's see what Paul says here. We're going to have our reading. Galatians, Galatians two. Paul talks <coughs> in Romans and Galatians, and also the book of Hebrews, I say that, he was the thought to be the traditional author. I don't know who wrote Hebrews. If you want to say Paul wrote it, I'll, I don't think he did, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, he was taken by all the early church to be the author. That was not disputed, really, in the early church. Um, but it's become disputed in more recent times. The, the fact is, though, each of those books pick up that little phrase in Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, and develop it. Romans talks about the just shall live by faith. Galatians talks about the just shall live by faith. Hebrews talks about the just shall live by faith. And some scholars have noted that there's a particular emphasis on the just in, he, in Romans, and shall live in Galatians, and by faith in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. So Paul talks about that, and that's something we need to see. And this is what the Reformation gets. John 1, 1 to 18, the church got that. It's not going to as clearly get this until the Reformation. So Galatians 2, 15, we'll begin there. We'll read into chapter 3. We ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no flesh or no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I reveal what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Oh foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit, notice the emphasis on the Spirit, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law? Or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, or the just shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, <clears throat> Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. We might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Well, so I want us to look at this a little bit more, more specifically at, as I say, the fuller doctrine of the Spirit and of the Church. Because we don't want to, we want to get to our doctrine of the church. It's it's properly and only a Protestant doctrine. It's properly developed only when we go to the Spirit first. Okay, as we hear Paul doing here. It's interesting when you when you have something clarified for you. Sometimes how you see, wow, this is really all over the place. But to think particularly about this doctrine of justification. Um, and I say here, recall the place of such for Augustine. Let me say a little bit more about what happened with Augustine. Augustine's Milanese acquaintance, Augustine was converted in 387 in Milan under the preaching of Ambrose, who was bishop of Milan. And he came, uh, he began laboring over the course of the years, and about a decade later, around 396, his friend Simplicianus kept pressing him with a question, or had pressed him with a question, but he pressed him with a question that Augustine, as he put it, had happily avoided. And he was pressed with this question, why did God hate Esau? And Augustine said that. I don't want to deal with that. It's a hard question. And it is a hard question. It's a very hard question. But he went to Romans 9. And he looked at it and thought about it and prayed about it and worked on it. And what he came up with was this. He came up with, he left his study of this saying that Man does not have, as had been conjectured by many up to that point, think of Justin Martyr or Tertullian or Chrysostom, had spoken in ways, and if you read them, their names are all there. If you read those sorts of fathers, you could say, well, they sound sort of like Pelagius, but they're, they're before Pelagius. 
Justin Martyr talks a lot about free will. And he seems to speak in an unhindered, like we just have free will, like Adam had free will before the fall. Tertullian says that by, obe by obeying, we make God our debtor. And Chrysostom speaks about man in a way that, that seems that he's not dead in sin and he has ability to obey God freely and easily even. But these, these folk are all writing before Augustine comes to clarify these things. Now let me just say this about, about them. Um, where do I point this out? I, was, I looked at that before coming here. Maybe Were they mentioned in the last lecture? Did you see the name there? The last one, first section. I'm sorry. Lecture one, section A. Oh, okay. It's in lecture one. Okay, thank you. It's in C5 with all that stuff. C5. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Augustine. Yeah, it's, in, it's in lecture one. Augustine, over against Pelagian-like expressions of Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and Chrysostom, did come to understand grace as, as had not been done since Paul. And that's true. Nobody understood grace that clearly. Uh, and you would say, you would say well, people often ask the question, of, well, why not? Why, why, did they understand, why did they understand that Jesus was God, Jesus was Lord, why did it take them so long to come to understand Paul's emphasis on grace and the kind of thing we just read in, in Galatians 2? Well, let me, ask, let me ask you this. Do you understand it? Don't you often live as if God accepts or rejects you on the basis of your performance? Now, be honest with me. Do you often live that? I, don't care. I didn't ask you what you believe or know up there in the noggin. What's sort of up there in the cranium somewhere. But how you really live. And see, here's the thing. If you come to understand what was taught by the Reformation, which I think we've barely begun to grasp. Notice how I just put that. Barely begun to grasp it. If we come to understand that, we come to understand. Well, think of it this way. If God doesn't accept you fully and completely, this is a kind of negative way of putting it, and it's helpful. If God doesn't accept you fully and completely because of what is because of what Christ has done, what can you do? You ever thought of it that way? In other words, if Jesus did what he did, and that doesn't gain you perfect acceptance, and you're going to do what to get it? If what he did doesn't get it for you, you're going to do what to get it? And hopefully just put it, I see you smiling, that means you get it. That means you get how ridiculous that is, really. You're going to add to the work of Christ in some way? You're, you're, you're going to do something to make Jesus accept you? You say, but don't we have to, don't, aren't we to seek to please Jesus? Aren't we to seek to live for Jesus? Did I say anything about that? Yes, I to seek to live for Jesus, but not so as to be accepted by him, but because I am accepted by him. His acceptance is the basis of my living to please him. I'm not living as I'm living so that he will accept me. Because if, 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 it's, if it's based on what I have to do to be accepted, well, I'm never going to be acceptable. I'm never going to be acceptable. Because I can't do enough. But I don't need to do anything to be accepted. He's done everything. He said, well, where do we come in? It's a free gift. We get to live it out. It's gratitude. So we're, we're not living. This is the genius of the Reformation. That's the title of the sermon tomorrow. 
And that's not Pastor Wellow, though he's a very bright guy. He's not the genius of the Reformation or me or anybody else. The genius of the Reformation means what was it really about? And I say this all the time to my students. If the Reformation didn't get this right, didn't get anything right. If it didn't get this right, this is the most important thing with respect to our relationship to God. What's the basis of it? Is the basis of our relationship a complete, unconditional acceptance based on who Jesus was and what he did? Or is it somehow conditioned on me and my performance? But you say, but, but don't our, doesn't our performance matter? See, if, if you can't understand what I'm saying without asking that question, you don't get the Reformation. If you immediately want to go to that question, you don't get it. Yes, it matters how we live. But a right standing with God isn't based on how we live, but based on who Christ was and what he did. That's, that's really what we're, I mean, we're going to really focus on that tomorrow morning. So well, you're talking about it right now. We, there's lots to say about it. And isn't this the, isn't, this is the gospel. Don't you want to hear it? Do you want to hear it again? And again and again, it's wonderful. It's the gospel. So, as I say, Augustine was responding to some of this stuff. Now, part of the reason that Justin Martyr and so forth, you have to understand them in their context. Justin Martyr was specifically dealing with a context in which the leading philosophy of his day was Stoicism. Okay, here we go with more stuff I'm thinking about. That's okay. That's okay. Stoicism was, I remember one professor of mine, and there are some folks here, older folks here, so you'll appreciate this. I remember one professor of mine is trying to, as an undergraduate, trying to define Stoicism. And this was back in the day when this was relevant. Somebody said, Professor, give us an example of somebody that who would you say is stoical? And he get, he said, uh, Matt Dillon. Remember the old gun smoke? <laughs> so, if you don't, it doesn't matter. But it was an old Western. And he was just sort of this unperturbable, impassive. It didn't matter what happened. Stoicism is this extreme fate notion. Okay? Stoicism was, it was the dominant philosophy of that day, of the 2nd century, 3rd century AD. And Stoicism had this conviction that everything that happens is a matter of fate, we really can't do anything about it. And it destroyed human responsibility. So when you read somebody like a Justin Martyr, when he talks about, no, man has a free will, you've got to understand that he's arguing often against the Stoics. And you can't just read him as like being Pelagius or Arminius. That's it's not the context. So that's a little bit of there. All of these men have their context, but when it comes to Augustine, he read, Simplicianus put the question to him, I got Hades saw, and he said, well, I don't want to look at this, but he came to this, that man existed in a fourfold state. Do you all know the fourfold state of man? Before the fall, he had, I won't, I'll just spare you the Latin, man, you know, was posse peccari, posse non peccari. Man was able to sin and able not to sin before the fall. After the fall, man is not able not to sin. So Augustine said, man in his second state is dead in sin. And he came to look at that as he thought about Jacob and Esau and all that question. As he read Romans 9. There are vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. He reads all that, but he says, part of the thing is now, man simply is given over to sin. And then man in his third state, which is regenerated, he's able to sin and able not to sin. If you're renewed in Christ, you, you're able not to sin, though you're certainly able to sin as well. In glory, that's the fourth state, you're not able to sin. So able to sin, able not to sin, first state, second state, fallen man, not able not to sin. Third state, renewed man, able to sin, able not to sin. Final state, of the, of the glorified, of the 
blessed, not able to sin. So Augustine came to this understanding of man in his fourfold state, and that man needed the grace of God. He needed a work of the Holy Spirit to give him a new birth. He came to a clear understanding of all this. Though he still thought of justification, he didn't know Hebrew, so he didn't know tzedek and that whole the root word there for righteousness. Dikaisune uh, in the Greek, he, he probably didn't know Greek, uh, Greek, he certainly didn't know it very well. He knew Latin. And the Latin text of his day is his, you know, Jerome would be putting this together in the so-called Vulgate. And the word there was used to ficare in the Latin, which he took wrongly. And there's, a, there's, there's too much here to get into the linguistic discussion. I mean, you can read it if you're interested about it. There are lots of places to read it. But, uh, McGrath has it in that book I was talking mm -hmm. about, Justitia Day. He says, Augustine says, or believed that this justificare was to make righteous rather than justification came to be understood by Luther and Calvin as to declare righteous. And Augustine talked about the prochesis justificationis, the process of justification. And let me just distinguish here for you a moment. He talked about, we don't have a board, but he talked about, Augustine talked about the process of justification in the way that we would talk about the process of salvation, the whole thing, in other words. We would talk about justification and adoption and sanctification and preservation or perseverance and glorification. And then back of that, we would talk about, uh, of course, we would, we would also talk about, before justification, we would talk about faith and repentance and so forth. But we talk about election and all that. So, all that is kind of the process of salvation. Well, instead of writing salvation there, Augustine wrote justification of the whole process. Augustine understood that we had to be justified. That is to say, we had to be, in some fashion, go from our sin and misery to a right state before God. He just didn't, he wasn't quite clear on how this would occur. And after him, particularly, this is what develops in the theology of the church. This is what develops in the theology of the medieval church. You start with justification begins with the church begins to teach. This is the Roman Catholic Church. It's our church. We weren't part of a different church. You say, well, I wasn't ever part of that church. Don't confuse the matter. There was one church in the West and one in the East. So that's what I mean by that. Um, but the, the teaching became that initial justification, that is to say, an initial being made righteous, occurs in baptism. So we're gonna, we need to talk about this now, how this worked, how what the theology actually was here leading up to this. So the idea was that initial justification occurs in baptism. But there's sin after baptism. You're going to sin. And the thought was, well, you're righteous when you're baptized. But any sin, certainly what we would call mortal sin, and they distinguish mortal and venial sin. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff here to flesh out. That sin destroys the grace that was given. Grace is viewed, well, first of all, sin is viewed as something ontological. That is to say, it changes your being. You say, well, doesn't it change your being? No. No. Sinful humans are still humans. They're not some other kind of being. Sin is ethical, not ontological. Sin is ethical. Again, I'm not suggesting you're going to get all of this. But there's the notion that sin is ontological is fictive. It's, it, and there's no basis in, in anything biblical. Uh, a human is a human. And because humans are fallen, doesn't mean they're animals or they're not really humans. They're fallen humans. They're ethically affected throughout the whole of their being. We call that total depravity. It doesn't mean that they're, as, they're demons. They're as bad as they can be. But it means every part of their being is affected by sin. Okay, that's totally depraved. 
So we affirm that. This is ethical, though. It's not a substance. It's not some kind of a substance. So they view grace as a substance. So the view comes to be, after Augustine particularly, that when you're baptized, bat, what does baptism do? This is what the Roman church believes in the Middle Ages and up to this day. What I'm talking to you about is still the way the Roman church believes this. I mean the Roman Catholic church. They believe that baptism washes away the state of original sin and any and all actual sins. Now, this is one of the reasons well, if you read somebody like Tertullian, he tells you to wait to get baptized. Constantine waited till his deathbed. Now, the thing is, you don't always know when you're on your deathbed. That's the bad thing about that. But waited till his deathbed to get baptized because he didn't know how to deal with the sin after baptism. God requires you to be righteous, holy. And this is how you get there. So, but the idea is justification is initial is initial with baptism. But there's sin that comes in. And so what are you going to have to do? Well, you're going to have confirmation and penance. Well, you're, before, you have, before you have confirmation, you're, go, you're, going, to have your first, you're going to have your first confession uh, to your priest. You'll confess your sins when you're of proper age. You'll have your confession of sin. Uh, you'll have your... Um, You'll, you'll, you'll be assigned penance. You, you know, do this and do that. What they say is the death of Christ took away the eternal penalty of sin. But you have to pay the temporal penalty of sin. That's what penance is for. Okay? So you have to do penance. And you're confirmed. This all occurs at the same time. Now it's all split up. I guess first Holy Communion, as it's usually called, is around 7, 8 now, I think. Age of 7 or 8. It wasn't. It was at the same time as confirmation. You're confirmed, 11, 12. You take communion, that's your first. So, so you have this, and, and confirmation is done by bishop, and that's the second blessing. Because the bishop goes, oh, what's he do? What's he like, some kind of a, you know, scope commercial or something? I mean, you know, you know get, some, get something there, your eminence. No. What's he doing when he does that? He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the bishop's doing when he does that. <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit. So the idea is you have initial justification in baptism, but you have a falling away from that. Because you sin. There's sin there. And so you have, you have confirmation. You have penance. You have the Eucharist. You take the Eucharist and you take it again and again and again and you confess your sin again and again and again to the priest. And this is giving you grace back. It's giving you grace. It's giving you this substance of grace. Sin is like a substance. And grace is a substance. And so sin, mortal sin, cancels grace. And getting the substance again cancels the sin. There's this interplay going on all the time. And so this goes on throughout the whole life. And then the, the two main venues, whether you go into the priesthood, that's holy orders. That's a, that's a sacrament. Or matrimony, that's a sacrament. You've got this, so you've got baptism, you know, penance, confirmation, um, Eucharist. You've got holy orders, both of those, and then you, you've got the uh, the via this the uh, uh, extreme unction uh, at the at the end of life, which um, remits again sins, so that you can, it, it, if you die, it, it makes sure you die in a state of grace. What does this mean? You go right to heaven. Oh, are you serious? What do you think? You're a saint? <laughs> so the view, this is the view, okay? This is the view. You got that grace way back in baptism. You spent your life, you know, trying to get it back through the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist. You spent your life getting, seeking to get it back and through penance, through good works, seeking to get back into the favor of God. But when you die... Well, if you die in the commission of mortal sins and unforgiven and all that, you go to hell. But the church doesn't think hardly any... It's a kind of general church. No. So we don't know that hardly anyone goes there. Not many. That's all. Because you know, if you want to tell me, well, I know a priest who said hardly anybody goes to hell. Yeah, I find that hard to believe that a priest says that. But what happens, though, is you die. Most people die. 
and let's say they're baptized and they've gone to church, they've, gone, they've received the Eucharist, they die, let's say God requires a 100 when you die. That is, he requires that you've achieved perfection, essentially. You say, well, that, nobody does that. That's what a saint does. A saint's achieved it. That's the view. This is the view of the Roman church. So Augustine, or just now, I guess, John the 23rd, and we're just told now, John the 23rd and John Paul II, achieved in their lifetime a state of perfect holiness. That's what, if you listen to any of this, but that's what, that was said in there. They've achieved a state, they achieved in their lives a state of perfect holiness, which means what? It means that at their death, they immediately gained the beatific vision, which is to say they went to heaven and to the immediate presence of God. The church doesn't believe that happens to most people. Most people have to go to purgatory. Why? To be purged. To be made perfectly holy. Because only when you are, in and of yourselves, perfectly sanctified and perfectly holy, then and only then does God declare you to be righteous. Now, saints are those about whom it was known to have happened in this lifetime. The church doesn't say they're the only people. They're say, they say they're the only people about whom it's known. Maybe your Aunt Millie was a saint. We, just, we don't know it. And it's presumption to assume it. So, you know, and if she was, she went right to heaven. The saints are those that we know went to heaven right away. Most people go to purgatory. And what happens there? They're purged. They're sanctified. And when they're finally and thoroughly sanctified, then and only then are they justified. Finally justified. Initial justification, baptism. Final justification, either when you die as a saint, and as... They might say good luck with that. Or the fires of purgatory have done its work. Now here's the good thing. Here's the two things about purgatory. Good news, bad news. Good news, you can only go to heaven from purgatory. Bad news, it doesn't exist. Heaven <laughs> purgatory. What's that? Purgatory. There is no purgatory. Scripture doesn't teach anything close to that. There is, it is appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. There's heaven and hell. There's no evidence of a third place. There's just no evidence. The Maccabees talks about prayers for the dead, which people take to imply this. You know, there are various things. Yes, you had a question? Well, I was going to ask that. I thought there was a scripture reference that talked vaguely about that. Prayers for the dead in the Maccabees. Which is not part of the canon. No. They don't say it's part of the canon. They say it's part of the Deutero canon. In other words, the apocryphal books are not recognized as fully canonical. They're sort of partly canonical. It's kind of weird. And that happens at Trent. That doesn't happen to the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. So at any rate, this is the, this is the way this works. So for Augustine... And there's this, there's this making of righteous, and this occurs over the course of this time, and ultimately it occurs there in purgatory. Luther came to see otherwise. Luther came to realize that the righteousness that God always and inflexibly required, God does require righteousness, but he gives freely as a gift, received by faith alone. And that's because we can have it. There's very clear evidence in the Bible that we can have and know in this life this. What would Rome say? What would Rome say about any of us saying, I have the perfect righteousness of Christ now and perfectly accepted before a holy God? What would they say? You're deceived. Yes. And they would say, that's presumption. And they would say, you can't know it except by special revelation. They wouldn't say, no saints have ever known that, but they had special revelation. And they would say, do you have the stigmata? Does everybody know what the stigmata are? The wounds of Christ. Like St. Francis of Assisi supposedly had. 
bleeding wounds. And they say, well, that's, that's a sign from God that you're a saint. But that's special revelation. And of course, hardly anybody receives that. So for you to say, I have a perfect standing with the Holy God because of Jesus Christ, they would say that's the height of presumption. You can't even begin to know that. All you can know is that you have the grace of God given to you in baptism if you've been baptized properly within our fold. And you're seeking to observe all of the rites that we set before you. You're, you're making up. But when the, your life ends, Brother George, it's very likely that you're, you will still have some temporal penalties to pay for sin. It's, it's, you know, most people don't pay all the temporal penalties. Yeah, Jesus took care of the eternal, so that means you don't go to heaven. But it's almost certain you're going to have to go to purgatory and pay some time. And, you know, and it's just, it's just a lack of humility if you, don't, if you think you don't have to. Unless we can be convinced that you're really a saint, then it's not a lack of humility, it's just a great thing. It's kind of interesting. Well, what the reformers said was, all who trust in Christ alone are saints. That is to say, they're declared holy. Paul addresses them as such in the Bible. He writes to whole big churches, calls them all saints. So, you know, I don't think he's meaning, you know, only... A couple people are saints. He means that God's people, those who trust in Christ. It doesn't also mean that everybody in those churches, head for head, is necessarily truly trusting in Christ. But sufficiently so that I could address, like I could address you, thinking you trust in Christ. That's the saints of God. Yes. Saved by fire. No, Jude and Second Peter. Peter. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, I think it's First Peter four, um, verse eighteen. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? Is that what you're thinking of? No, I would think she's thinking no, of. It, it says something like. Oh, oh, that they will be saved as through fire. I think you were thinking of Jude, as no, I said. Three, I think. Yeah. Uh, three, no, three, I think three, she's thinking of this, ma'am. 20, uh, 22 Jude, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of fire. To others show mercy with fear. Is that hating the garment stained by the flesh? Snatching them out of the fire? Or does that not what you're talking about? No. Okay, well you can think about it and come back. Yes? 1 Corinthians 3.15. Well you do, you're, you are talking, well, yeah, okay, That's that has to do with um, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay, is that the one you meant? Yeah. Um, well, I take that having to do, the, the question is, what is the section addressing? And I believe the section is addressing, if you look at the section, which we don't really have time to do this, but if you read back, I'm, I'm just giving you the results. I'm not giving you everything that gets me there. I believe this section is particularly addressing in a pointed way, not that it doesn't have broader implications, but it's pointedly addressing ministers of the gospel. And it has to do with how ministry was carried on. If you look at it, Paul's talking about his ministry. And that in the ministry uh, of others with him who are God's fellow workers. He's talking about Apollos and himself and how he carried on ministry. And he's talking about those who use the proper kind of materials in ministry and those who don't. And those who minister in some fleshly way, though truly, it's, it's, there's much there that's destroyed, though they themselves may be saved. So, I don't believe this is a re reference in a general way to Christians. And there's, there's quite a line of interpretation. Now, this is something about which people disagree. But the historic reformed interpretation is along the lines that I'm suggesting. It has to do with the way that particularly ministers' ministry is judged.
Some have argued that. Yeah. Some have argued that, but it, it, I think if you look at it in the context, it, if this is talking about all Christians, it's a very strange way of speaking to them. It, 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 it's, it's clearly talking to those who are ministers of the gospel. It's very clearly talking. Now, if it means something beyond that, it means something in that same kind of context. And it has to do with, it has to do with not them being um, sort of, purgatory has to do with you being burned and coming through the fire. This is what that's talking about. This is talking about your works being burned up. That is, or, or, or that with which you were involved, wood, hay, and stubble, as opposed to precious gold and silver, uh, gold and silver and precious stones. Those things stand the test of fire. These things don't stand the test of fire. So I think it's saying there's certain, one can have ministry, one can do ministry in ways in which that which one builds with doesn't stand the test of fire and there are ways in which it does stand the test of fire. I think it's saying if you minister in fleshly ways, though you may be a Christian minister, if you don't minister in the way God has appointed, that ministry which is in fleshly ways, and there are all kind of men who are Christians, I think, but who minister in various sorts of fleshly ways, <clears throat> other than just what God has appointed, if you minister in those ways, that will perish. So you yourself will be, it's just being clear to say, Paul is saying, I'm not saying you're going to be damned, but I'm saying your ministry will come to nothing if you don't minister in the way Christ tells you to minister. That's precious gold and silver. The way he told you to minister. The way people do. I mean, think of the ways in which. I mean, there are good Christian men, I think, who get silly ideas in their heads and they think, well, the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments and prayer, this just isn't doing it. We've got to have some ministry with some. And it, it could be different things in the past, but I'm just contextualizing it for today. You know, we've got to have some jazz and pizzazz and we've got to do some. We gotta do something here that really, you know, some uh, a little song, a little dance is what was it? Chuckles the clown, a little song, a little dance, a little seltzer down your pants. I mean, that's a, that's the way some churches are. Well, it, it doesn't mean that these ministers are not Christian in any sense, but it does mean their ministry is of no value. Yeah. Like, well, I'm a life coach. I, I don't talk. I let others talk. I'm not. I mean, I don't know who I could be possibly referring to here. But I'm a life coach. Uh, that's not my. That's not my thing to talk about sin. I let others talk about sin. You know. Okay. You, you, you just have to not imagine me with you know nice hair and teeth and a nice suit. Yes. One other thing about that. I understand purgatory. That's a literal fire. Yeah. And Paul speaking metaphorically. Right. But but again, he's not talking about it applying to a person who the, the right. doctrine of purgatory is yeah. You You're right. No. This yeah. is metaphorical. Right. Your your burn, you're saved. Right. But it's uh, the fires of hell are a fi fires which burn eternally and you're never delivered from. Purgatory, they would say, there is it is torment, though not as intense as hell, and it purges you literally and you're delivered. So yeah. Well, let's see where we are here. Uh, what time are we done? Well, we started a little bit late. If, if you can wrap it up in five or ten minutes. Okay, very good. Oh, well, I, I wanted to kind of give you that, and, and you might say, wow, we've got a lot of stuff here. But I've given you this stuff in some way or another here. Um, as I say, for Luther, and we're going to talk much more about this tomorrow morning. Uh, so this insight transformed him from one. This insight that the, that the righteousness that God requires, he gives by faith, uh, or he gives freely as a gift received by faith alone. Luther says when he saw that, the gates of paradise opened, he did enter in. Um, and I'll talk more about Calvin's contribution tomorrow as well. I, I've got some things to say in the sermon about that. But this, this sort of comes down, again, this is part of the whole fuller doctrine of the Spirit. Um, which is understanding uh, what Calvin captured and others captured, that you know the Holy Spirit takes all of this of Christ and gives it to us. And that simply was not understood with any clarity 
in the Middle Ages. And as I noticed here, or as I put it here, the context, uh, notice there under the fuller doctrine of the Spirit, the context in which all of this occurs, the work of the Spirit, is the church. A proper doctrine of the church must follow and be the consequence of a proper doctrine of the Spirit. And we'll talk about this also tomorrow in the Sunday School. Uh, the Spirit is the one who gathers and perfects the church. Uh, but we, we must read the church through the lens of the Spirit. Otherwise, we're in danger of developing and giving way to churchianity. Now, in the broader culture, in the broader evangelical culture, there tends to be the opposite extreme. I mean, there's, there's no doctrine of the church. There's a low view of the church. But you see, some people like the FV people, their, their cure for this is to go too far in the other direction. So in other words, when we see evangelicals not getting the church and having a low view of the church, our response shouldn't be to, to, have, to go to the opposite direction and have an idolatrous view of the church or a Romish view of the church. That's not the right solution. That's not what we need. That's not what we need. We've had in the Reformed faith, in Calvin, in the Reformed confessions, we have a very clear, good, stable balance uh, of these doctrines as is set forth. So I say here, our doctrine of the church and our theology must develop out of our doctrine of the spirit. And I go on to talk about other things there, ending up even saying Calvin's doctrine of the Lord's Supper was a great advance over that of Rome, Luther, and Zwingli. But Calvin's doctrine of the whole of the Lord's Supper comes directly out of his doctrine of the Spirit. <coughs> because Calvin understands the Spirit brings us to Christ and Christ to us. And Calvin says what happens in the Lord's Supper isn't so much Christ coming down, the, the emphasis, it's a wrong emphasis to think of him as coming down and, and being either corporeally in the elements, we're talking about that, like the Romans teach, uh, or a, a kind of a sacramental union as the Lutherans teach. Not so much that, as the Spirit lifts us up, where Christ is seated in the heavenlies, and we're seated with Him in the heavenly places. He lifts us up so that we commune with Father, Son, and Spirit. That's, that's you say, wow, that's pretty heavy. So, right, right. I mean, there's a sense in which, but this is what we're going to see tomorrow as well. There's a real presence of Christ in the sacraments, in preaching. There's a real presence in preaching. When the Word of God is faithfully preached, it's not simply some guy standing there giving you his opinion. When the Word of God is faithfully preached, it's one who represents Christ as an ambassador. Standing, in, you say, how do you have the real presence of Christ in preaching? You have the Word of Christ being given to you. And the Spirit who gave the Word particularly empowers the, the preaching of it. It's, it's never so clear. I, I remember once somebody saying to me, well, I told somebody at work, an evangelical colleague, that the word was so was the clearest to me when it's preached. And he said, well, that's not right. It should be the clearest to you when you're reading it yourself. He said, is that right? I said, absolutely not. No, the word is meant to be a preached word. It's meant to be a preached word. That's not to say you can't understand it when you're reading it. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's never to be clearer to you when a man stands and faithfully opens it up because that spirit who gave it applies it in a particular way. And, you know, I remember going to my preacher once, Pastor Hollister, uh, Pastor Willow knows him, after a sermon that was just, do you know Bruce, Bruce Hollister? I think so. I went up to Bruce after a sermon. I was just... And I said to him, and he knew exactly what I was saying. And we, you know, I so appreciate him. I love him. He's, he's magnificent. And I said, Bruce, I, I mean, I was very moved. I was very emotional, so it was hard to say anything. And this is what came out. I said, you're not that good. <laughs> and he knew just what I meant. Just like you do. He knew what he had said was beyond him or me or anybody else. It was from God. And did he get, he was delighted that I said that because he knew that I heard Christ. I heard Christ speaking to me. I heard Jesus Christ speaking to me through this mere man. And I mean, you know, I, that 
That can happen. That's, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. When we just, when it's Christ, when, when he comes out and, and he, you know. And I said, you're not that good. And he said, no. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it? I said, it sure is. It sure is. That he uses people like us. I mean, what a, somebody here said, sense of humor with respect to something else. I mean, yeah. That he uses schleps. The little Yiddish word there. Like me or Pastor Well Albert, I mean, he's a nice schlep. I mean, he's a nice schlep. But we're, we're, none of us are anything to write home about. We're just people. But the, God uses that. And bread and wine to lift our hearts up to be seated. I mean, and prayer. You come directly before the throne. We can talk more about this. We, we do it all the time. But I mean, think of what an amazing thing that it is. We can do at every moment what no Israelite of old could ever do. But the high priest, once a year, with blood of bulls and goats, in shadows and tights and darkness, not in the finished work of Christ, and what you know, I just I just preached Good Friday, and, and I was I did a wonder if I enjoyed it so much. A conference out in Portland, Maine, and they invited me for Easter. I've never had that before. Usually they always say, "Well, look at your calendar." Oh, we don't want to do it here. It's Easter. And he said, "Come do one. Would you like to speak? Give three talks Friday and a couple on Saturday on the death and burial of Christ, and then three on Sunday, including Christian Education Hour in the evening, on the resurrection." And I'm like. All these sermons on the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I'm like, you know, I said, I think I said something like, does the Pope want to say Mass? You know, I said, I said yes. Yes, I want to do this. But there's nothing greater to talk about. And what gives us that access, and we're done here, is that that curtain was torn in two. And I mean this reverently. Remember where I'm from. It's like God saying, y'all all come in. Come on in. Draw near. Come in. Never before. This is where we live. God is saying, draw near to me. And I'll draw near to you. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for thinking about and being able to think about in these first two sessions something of what's gone on in the church up to and including the Reformation. We thank you for that great recovery of the gospel. And as we continue to look at it and think about it, help us, give us fruitful thinking. In Jesus' name.